Christian's going to do all the I'll, driving I'll be standing here. here driving the slides. And uh, we can get into the beginning while we all get settled. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about T, the New York Times style magazine. Um, it's actually a, a client we've been working with for a, a very, very long time. Uh, the New York Times has two magazines, the, the Sunday magazine that comes out every week, and T, which comes out uh, less frequently. Um, and when T was launched in 2004, um, it was really an outgrowth of the New York Times magazine. Uh, it grew out of the style section, and um, because of that, it shared really the same design DNA with the magazine as a whole. Uh, it was the same type palette, same grid, same formats. And the one thing that they had done really to differentiate it was commissioned this uh, black letter typeface from Matthew Carter, um, which was used throughout the feature well. And this was a, a clever and memorable reference to the nameplate uh, of the newspaper. And we first started working uh, with T in 2007 when we did this typeface Giorgio. And uh, Giorgio was an interesting project because Often when a, a client comes to us, they have typographic references that they want us to look at. Uh, there's a particular sans serif that they're in love with that's not working for them for whatever reason. So they say, could you make something sort of in this geometric sans genre uh, that will actually work for us? But with T, it was much more about atmosphere and about uh, giving a particular feeling to the features. So what they wanted us to react to rather than a particular typeface or set of typefaces was uh, what was happening in fashion in that particular moment. So uh, fashion is always about tall, thin, elegant, beautiful vertical lines, but this was a, a particularly vertical season. All black and white, uh, and metallics, and that uh, held true on the men's side as well. So we said, we can respond to all of this, but it would help to know something about typefaces that you like and are interested in right now, um, at least what you're thinking about. And they showed us this typeface uh, Corvinus from the Bauer Foundry, and uh, in particular, this very quirky interpretation of it by Dennis Ortiz Lopez. And the idea with this typeface was to bring something to the feature well that would um, help tie the, the year's issues together um, visually and respond and match well with the fashion. And they called in December, and the first issue was uh, going to be coming out in January. So we didn't really have the time that we usually do to reflect on what we're doing and, um, and sit with it for a while. So I was concerned while working on this typeface that it might be the worst thing that we had ever done. But seeing it in the context of the magazine, with the work that David Seba and his art director Chris Martinez were doing, it made sense. It matched the fashion. It brought a particular atmosphere to the spreads, and they were using it with a very light touch. They could be illustrative with it, or they could use it to um, really put a lot of text on the page with this particular feeling. The women's issues tended to use a lot of the lowercase, whereas the men's issues focused on the, uh, the caps and the sort of old Hollywood glamour sort of elegance that they had, a bit of Art Deco. And for the last issue of the year, they had a design studio called Nonformat do a remix of the Typeface Giorgio and draw out some other things in it. Um, and Chris said, they didn't want to ask my permission. They just thought they would ask my forgiveness afterwards um, <laughs> in case I hated what they did. But I thought it was a really interesting way to uh, remix the Typeface and bring something new out of it. And something that really only made visual sense in the magazine because they'd spent the year establishing Giorgio as the look of the year. Now at this point, fashion was changing, and uh, this was designed only to be used for one year, after which it would be retired. McQueen looked like this for 2007, and this for 2008. Proportions, color palettes, materials, everything was changing. But Chris called and he said, I think we could get another year out of Giorgio, but we want to remix it. We want to take what non-format had done and sort of build that into the typeface. So we altered the round characters to change from this very regular texture of verticals and bring a different kind of uh, texture 
to words in this typeface. And I think there was no more perfect use of this typeface with the rounds than Yaya Kusama. In 2009, Chris got in touch again and he said, I know we were going to retire Giorgio, but what if we did a sans? We could use the bold weight a lot in all caps, and I think this would work well with our fractor because if we had a thin weight that was the same weight as the thins of the fractor, we could mix them together and do something distinctive. And so in a lot of the spreads, they used it in all caps, and the words became these rectangular modules that could kind of lock together almost like Legos. But there were also some very uh, unusual alternates that were evocative of what they had previously in Giorgio. Um, it was nice to see it mixed together with the fractor. And uh, occasionally, they would mix all of these parts together. And Chris was really not afraid to cut things up and mix things together and do what he had to do to make an evocative spread. In 2010, they were redesigning again. And he came to us for this typeface, Carl, which Burton worked on. And I think it was one of the first custom typefaces I started on. Yeah, I, I think, think it was. So. Um, but yeah, it was, it was sort of an interesting kind of criteria for me because it was pretty straightforward kind of, um, well, yeah, criteria. Basically, Christian had showed um, Chris uh, typeface, a typeface called Marianne that had a style of black letter that was hairline. Um, Chris liked the look so much, he thought it could be interesting to uh, apply this idea to the black letter that um, they had for tea. So they commissioned us to draw Carl, which was basically a hairline version of the black letter they had that matched the weight of the thinnest parts of that black letter. And along the design process, he sort of had an interesting request where he asked us to draw these um, swashes that were very alien to the form of the fracture. Um, where the factor was very angular, these swashes were very loopy, and they varied in degree in terms of how flourished they were. Um, I spent, I think, a good part of a day just sort of using a ballpoint pen, just doodling as much as I could, um, as many variations as I could, um, these different types of swashes to be applied, basically bolted on to these letters. Um, here, it's sort of crazy. I, I don't, you'd never really set a block of text like this, but the way that Chris used it um, was very sparingly um, for things like initial caps and um, also paired with the original weight of the black letter and smaller text. So in 2011, both magazines were being redesigned, and this was the point where T and the New York Times Style Magazine uh, and uh, the New York Times Sunday Magazine completely diverged. They were still the same size, but the type palettes, the grids, the structures, all of this was, uh, was finally separating once and for all. And um, a new editor came in at T, um, Sally Singer, who wanted to uh, completely revamp the look. And um, Chris came back and uh, commissioned this typeface PLA, which Burton drew. Yeah, I mean, it, it came originally from um, a film still that he sent us uh, f from a Maurice Piola film. Um, and he was really interested in the sort of soft, overexposed effect of this type. Uh, we had tried to find what typeface this was and uh, looked through a lot of old specimen books and, and sort of tore our library apart trying to find it. And uh, eventually, when the project was finished, we finally identified this as a typeface called Visa, designed by Rafael Bogoslav for uh, VGC Corporation, uh, which is a typesetting house and, and uh, machine manufacturer here in New York. Um, but it was interesting to see how this particular film still differed from what the typeface looked like in its intended form. The typeface was very sharp and felt much more like a stencil but by the time this was a phototype set and then exposed for the film and superimposed over the image, each step in the photographic process made it softer and softer and softer and gave it this eroded kind of feeling. So it had a completely different uh, atmosphere 
than what the original typeface had had. So we sort of took that handful of letters and drew a connected uppercase um, set to match it. And we also expanded it to a lowercase set as well. Um, it sort of had a high contrast, but these rounded edges to be both warm and elegant at the same time. The elegance was really um, increased when we got to the, the italic, when we um, referenced the Van Dyke um, model and we brought some of the swing of Van Dyke as well as its deep kind of joints to sort of work with that soft finish. And the idea was very much to have elegance, but kind of a rough, soft, quirky elegance. And this was the first time that one of the typefaces we had designed for display for T actually found its way to the entire magazine. Uh, it was used on the covers, and uh, you can see from the photography in these spreads that the, the whole feeling of the magazine had really changed. Um, there was uh, much more use of black and white. Still some illustrative uses of type, but this really played up the softness of the letter forms rather than, for example, those Carl spreads, the uh, prettiness of it. Soft type also really allowed for them to stack um, the type very like, tightly. Um, sort of just allowed for it to combine nicely in that way. Yeah, it had a certain sculptural quality to it that I think they really took advantage of. And uh, this is an example of a page from the front of book. So not just in the feature well, but in the front as well, PLA was bringing this particular feeling to the magazine as a whole from cover to cover. So this, uh, this look didn't go over all that well with advertisers, and uh, Sally Singer was, um, was let go and replaced by Deborah Needleman in 2013, which is when Patrick came in. Hi. So, yeah, Deborah Needleman was asked to go to the New York Times. Uh, we were both working at um, the Wall Street Journal magazine, WSJ magazine at the time, and I remember her calling one day and say, hey, what do you think about tea? And I'm like, yeah, that would be great. Um, so we went pretty quickly and um, immediately set out to commission a new typeface that really uh, reflected Deborah's sort of, um, yeah, her inclination. And really it was a, this, this uh, headline really sums it up for her where it really was about reestablishing a kind of elegance in, in the magazine. So um, we had, uh, I guess we go to the next. Um, we had, uh, um, I was working with um, uh, Sean Carney, who was an art director there, and Aurelie Pelessier. We were kind of just basically trying to figure out what the look and feel should be, and we were proposing different references, and um, we wanted a typeface that could, I guess, expand and react very quickly. Um, I had come across this um, lettering sample and an invitation, or was it, it was an artwork actually, that was an invitation to this artist, jean Frederick Schneider, his show in Frankfurt, and I was like, kind of blown away. It was hand-drawn, and the type was super wonky, and it was had um, a, a compression and expansion, and. It was incredibly beautiful and elegant, but so transgressive simultaneously. There was something really kind of weird about it. I thought it might be a good fit. So um, we gave Christian a call and asked him if there's any way that we could make a typeface that had variable widths. Um, and luckily, he was into the idea. And we tried to um, basically set out to develop uh, a kind of letter set that could, yeah, take that expansion and compression and um, I was super thrilled with the way it turned out. So it, it was based a little bit on Romana to start. That was like kind of the foundation where you see a lot of shared commonalities and then quickly became its own thing. So our process when working with a, a magazine generally starts with a handful of headlines uh, because the typical words that a type designer might come up with to look at the, um, all the important characteristics of a typeface, like, for example, the word hamburger fonsive, 
when you show that to people at a magazine, they don't really understand what that gibberish is, is about. So taking actual headlines is a good way to give some context and uh, help our clients look at a typeface in a way that, that makes sense to them and imagine it in the context of their own layouts. So um, after a meeting with Patrick and his team, Bert and I brought the, uh, the lettering and the other references back to the studio and started sketching. And uh, we came up with, with three main directions. This was the first one. And within each direction, we also looked at how particular details could play out in a systematic way to change the overall feeling of the typeface. So for example, the flat head serifs on the lowercase and the top versus the angled ones in the middle and uh, the sharp ball terminals in the top and middle versus the softer ones in the bottom. Sort of how by turning up and down different, part, different kinds of sharpness and different kinds of softness, we could give the typeface the right kind of feeling that they were looking for. Another sketch had a much bigger excite and a bit more of an organic feel, um, bringing in some other influences like uh, Windsor. Um, I don't know, Burton, if you could talk more about this one. The top two are, are sort of uh, based on Sheltonham, from what oh, I remember, that's right. um, because they have that kind of bloated A belly. And um, yeah, the Windsor was the, the bottom one with that, that A that leans sort of back to the left. Um, but also starting to play with how context might affect the letter forms. So an A that was at the end of the word might have that angle, whereas an A that was in the middle of a word would, uh, would stay vertical. And we also thought it might be clever or interesting to take Cheltenham, which is the typeface of the New York Times uh, newspaper, and use that as the basis for something that had this weird um, proportional effect and this kind of um, quirky elegance. We also experimented with pushing the limits of how wide and narrow um, all of this could get. And this was really about establishing limits so that we could then send all of this to our clients and uh, get their feelings on it. What's interesting at this point was um, working with Deborah, who's I guess the headlines changed pretty quickly and rapidly, and they were due the next day. We didn't have time to actually go and illustrate type or bring it into Illustrator and make uh, something display out of it. So we had to really just, um, uh, we had to work with a system that allowed us to change on the fly and still make um, kind of type tight stacks, which is something that I'm still obsessed with. And having this sort of variable widths allowed us to sort of lock type together really quickly and elegantly. So this is like the first study of how the same font could have all these different widths and still work together. And the idea really was to make something that sort of existed in an ambiguous gray area in between lettering and type. It's definitely a typeface, but it does a bit more um, than a typeface usually does in terms of uh, giving the user the ability to make lettering with it. And so after sending those sketches, we got back very detailed feedback, which is... Thanks to Sean, in the which back, is, back row there. It's always incredibly helpful um, to really get this window into what a client is responding to and uh, what they're not comfortable with. Uh, we learned that they, we didn't have to go as narrow with this as we thought we did. That was a budget thing. <laughs> and rather than spending their money on different widths, um, instead they had us do a very wide variety of alternate forms, which again, let them almost letter the headlines. It's, uh, it's sort of lettering with pre-made letters. It's really almost not something for nothing, but bang for your buck. That's, what, that's how we looked at it. And so the reason why the weights um, mix together as seamlessly as they do is um, if we change them to different colors and stack them on top of each other, these main strokes are exactly the same weight uh, regardless of what width the typeface is. 
So um, typically, a, a condensed is going to be a bit lighter than the normal width. A wide is going to be a bit heavier than the normal width, um, just so things feel balanced in and of themselves. So here, the condensed feels a bit heavier than the normal width does because um, those strokes are exactly the same thickness, which allows for lettering like this. Another important thing with this typeface, because we had pushed the limits of uh, thick and thin with it, was to get it to work in uh, gravure printing. How, I forget how gravure works. It floats the image on water, and that gets picked up by the paper. I think that it's it's a it's dry on the plate, and then gets rinsed off, or something. <laughs> I think it gets very blurry. It's always kind of gray on gray. There's streaking that happens a lot, especially on our uh, not so premium paper. But um, we took a chance with the the thins, and it actually worked out okay. And so when you see these optical sizes at their intended sizes, uh, you get the same extreme contrast and sense of elegance, regardless of how big the type is. So balancing out Schneider in the type palette was a graphic extra condensed, which had a sober and repetitive texture that balanced out the eccentricities of Schneider. And also Imperial, which is the text face from the newspaper which um, I thought was a very clever way to tie this into the, the main New York Times um, brand while also balancing out the prettiness of Schneider. We definitely wanted to combine um, certain aspects from the newspaper and bring in, uh, I guess, some of the key points that we thought were really intriguing about Imperial to celebrate something text-based or text weight and make it more into display. So um, uh, it was a good combination of the two at the time. Yeah, the newsiness of this was a, a bold and interesting choice for a fashion magazine. And this is an example of how all the parts came together. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to see the edges of the page here. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, we played a lot with the physicality of the actual printed medium. So the trim of the page, um, you'll see some later examples where there's a lot of emphasis on what happens in the gutter. Um, so imagine that's the edge of the page where it just really got cut off. Um, it was just a way of activating the type in ways that, um, uh, yeah, the different tools that we try to take advantage of. And so Schneider wasn't just um, the display face on opening spreads, but also um, brought its particular personality to things like pull quotes. Right. And drop caps. So this is when we're first, we're still a little shy with Schneider at this point, like we're not really exploiting as much as, um, as we could. And as the years went on, we got more, we tried to get more experimental with actual uh, distortion of characters um, and actually just making the type much larger and bigger. But sometimes um, you also played it very straight, like this. Yeah, we, it's rare that we did upper and lower but, um, for display, but some stories felt better with that. So is this one of the uh, later? That's one of the later ones. The later ones? Yeah. So yeah I can't see where the gutter is, but it's like it's really cutting into some of the letters. Um, we tried to have some legibility still, of course, a uh, key consideration. So I think it went through the H. Yeah, it looks like it goes through the middle yeah. of the H. So some letters were chosen so it would read across, across the gutter. Here's some it's used as a rubric or a section dividers, and then we mixed with um, graphic as another head. This is a 
one of our standard um, front of the book page layouts. Um, this is not really related to Schneider, but it's, um, we wanted to add some purely graphic, um, uh, graphic pages that were able to celebrate factoids in, in a way that seemed fresh for us. And it was just playing with this idea of different cartouches and boundaries, borders. But I think the, the balance between Schneider yes. and graphic here right. really shows kind of everything that these two typefaces do together. They work well together. Yeah. This is one of my favorite covers. Obviously, you recognize who that is, and we just made a big name, and it's a really kind of me a celebration of Schneider. It's like those letters are so beautiful to me. And can you talk a little bit about the differences between uh, designing covers for a magazine like T and a usual newsstand kind of cover? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Basically, because T comes with uh, the paper on the, on, not monthly, but almost once a month, that the audience is sort of built in. So we don't have to kind of uh, rely too much on multiple um, cover lines and you know, 23 ways to lose a pound and that sort of thing. So um, we uh, can be very sort of edited with um, the words that we use and uh, yeah, challenge the perception of what covers can look like within reason. I mean, there's still, it's still very much a magazine cover. Um, it's, yeah, it's, there's a certain kind of freedom that's imbued there at, at, um, at T and it's really uh, so grateful for that. So here's a, a use of graphic that was then sort of uh, beveled and made into a special display font. This, was, this existed only in Illustrator. Um, and basically, we uh, sort of set up a system just for this annual issue that we had called the Greats. It was a way to connect um, the sort of beveled T logo to some of the display using the existing fonts that we had. This, I think, was the final cover of this incarnation, wasn't yes, it? Yes, holiday 2017. This is the very last iteration of Schneider, and very sad day for all of us at the magazine, except for the new editor-in-chief. Um, <laughs> she's like, she couldn't wait to get rid of it, but it's, it was, it's, um, it's uh, yeah, we tried to use it as much as we could, large display inside, sad day. So maybe a year or two into um, Patrick and his team using Schneider, they had us add one more width to it, um, a wide version. And it was interesting to see in this uh, spread in particular how that round O is almost evocative of some of the games we had played with Proportion um, earlier with the remixed version of Giorgio. And uh, they had us add a handful of extremely dramatic alternates to this width. Um, which really let them push that feeling of lettering um, as far as it could possibly go. Yeah, this is actually um, a way of playing with this layering of text where we could really, yeah, have a lot of fun with uh, Schneider, but then obviously having, it's, I think someone thought it was illegible there at the magazine, so we put just the same box. We, repeated right on top and um, kind of looked really nice to me. And after they'd been using Schneider for a while, um, they had me apply this same effect to graphic, which was um, kind of an interesting challenge. Things don't usually line up so well between widths of a sans serif. There were a lot of compensations and, and uh, things like that that I had to take out to make this work, uh, for example, with the E's lining up and the P's in the third line. It's actually not such a complicated idea, but then actual, to get into the detail of the fonts, of the letter forms themselves, and to really understand the threshold of legibility where like, some of the counters could get really, really compressed. Um, some of the angles and relationships didn't really seem to uh, be of the same family, but you know, 
Christian was able to really take this challenge and actually make it into something that was really, really fun to play with. Um, so here's an example of, um, if you saw this in the magazine, the gutter is right there next to the edge of the image. And so the type is really compressed near the gutter. So there's a forced compression that kind of exaggerated um, uh, that experience of turning the page and you know, opening the page a little bit more, which was um, always kind of a fun experiment for us to see how far we could get away with uh, asking the production people to be really careful with you know, making sure the paper was aligned. And um, didn't really work out sometimes, but it was, like, it was a great exercise for us. So 2018, so um, Deborah left the magazine, Deborah Newman left the magazine, and Hanya Yanagahara, who's a novelist, uh, became the new editor-in-chief, and um, she has a very different perspective on um, what magazines should be doing um, and the culture, the time that we live in. So the typography and the display language, and in fact, the visuals and the entire visual language of the magazine had to shift considerably. So um, for her, culture now is uh, extremely, it's under siege and there's crisis and she wanted the typography to reflect this newsiness, this urgency that we live in today. So um, we went back to uh, Christian Burton to try to find solutions for this and we came up with all these different references of um, uh, sort of a, a combination of favorites um, that we had seen before like a lot of um, Times New Roman um, stacks. Um, this was, uh, these samples were compiled by myself and Dan Wagner who's also back there with Sean and um, Harry Gassel who basically um, uh, we culled together all these different uh, references of what we thought could be really super straightforward and bold and a little bit more, I guess you could say default to a certain extent. Um, and so these are references for fact, which you'll see a couple more, um, which is basically the type, the name that we gave to um, uh, the serif named in part to Lublin's Fact magazine. That was a big inspiration for us. Um, so you'll see a couple more uh, references here, like those tight type stacks and compositions. And the text. Uh, this, this typeface, Life by Officina Simoncini, um, also has a, sort of a timesness to it, but it's a bit rounder and a, a, a slightly different feeling. Um, so this was, was kind of an interesting take on that genre. Uh, just the idea that Times New Roman is not so much a typeface, it's almost a genre of typeface um, in, in all the variations that have been done on this design through the 20th century. And it was interesting for us uh, to come back to Times New Roman. Um, we had at one point um, started sketches for a new text face for Vanity Fair together with Kai Bernal. Um, and that had to be based on Times New Roman because the editor at the time, Graydon Carter, said the text has got to be in Times because Times looks like the truth. And so it was interesting to come back to that. But they also came with some other um, slightly out of left field references like this Section 25 cover by uh, Peter Saville, which is all in Bembo except for the lowercase g's, which are inexplicably in Bedon uh, Baskerville. And uh, do you remember why, why this was evocative for you? It was just one of the references that we thought resonated somehow. The, I guess the starkness of it. Um, also, there's a kind of, yeah, this was maybe slightly on the more elegant side of the yeah. references that we sent. But there's still a little bit of um, this uh, thinness. And we purposely went away from the common trope of um, high contrast type for this new iteration of T. So this, I mean, it was a reference because we thought it was so beautiful, but it, I don't think it was really as significant as some of the other stacks. I think we might have latched onto this a bit more yeah. than we should have. Yeah, it is beautiful. So, 
and some other references now for um, the Sands, which we named Kippenberger because we were inspired by Jim Dine. I don't know why he called it Kippenberger, but um, <laughs> it was, Jim Dine was a reference at um, this catalog that um, Hanya had and it was really important for her. So we wanted to, uh, yeah, kind of reimagine um, a compressed, condensed um, a sans serif that uh, we knew that her magazine would have a lot more words in it um, and a different kind of visual density. So we wanted to find a solution that could really compress um, tightly. And you'll see soon how that came to our advantage. Um, Gerstner is a huge example or uh, reference for us in terms of grids and philosophy. Um, and of course, Twen is a reoccurring uh, reference in terms of layout and treatment and the um, combination of type and imagery. And, and it did convey a kind of urgency that um, we didn't really have in the earlier iterations of T. And again, I think there was a, a kind of a defaultness to a lot of these um, where the, the condensed sands that Billy Fleckhouse used in Twen, um, it, it had a name, but it translates something as narrow, something like narrow grotesque. Um, not, not like a descriptive name, but just a, a category name. And Gerstner um, really redesigning Occident's grotesque to make it a bit more systematic. So it is Occident's, but it's also kind of not. And we were also looking a bit at some uh, really quirky sans serifs from uh, the Deverney and Peño foundry in France from the early 20th century, because these did have that kind of dense, immediate, and uh, very tight quality to them, but they also had something very human and very organic about them. And so we thought there might be something interesting to tap into here as well. There's also something we were interested in, like the, the combination of the squareness of the sands, how it could fill out um, some aspects where it reached the corners and some places where it didn't. So in the end, we had a, I mean, when you see the final example, it is square on the outside and the counters are much more rounded and circular. So it kind of created a little bit of this weird tension, which I thought was really compelling. So two of the main things that, um, that Patrick and his team had told us to, uh, to work with were the idea that the serif and the sands should be a matched set. They needed to have matching vertical proportions so that they could be mixed together in the same line um, without any kind of mismatch in size. And also this idea of density kept coming up. So when we were first sketching this, um, we liked the times idea but wondered if we could take something else as our starting point. We thought it was kind of clever and kind of a nice narrative to start from Imperial, the text face of the New York Times, rather than from Times, which is a bit more sort of generic in the world at large, but not as generic inside the world of the New York Times. And uh, to address the problem or the issue of density, we tried making the serifs extremely short. Uh, partly to get away from this cliched idea of a fashion typeface with long, thin, elegant serifs, and partly because that let us cram the letters together yeah. for this very dense feeling. And um, so we, we tried um, sort of an imperial-esque typeface with very short serifs, gave it a little bit more elegance with some longer serifs, and we also played around with some of the traits of Bembo, kind of mixing newsy proportions with a more old style treatment and uh, more old style um, unevenness in the, the widths of the letter forms. And all with a very, very tall X height. I think we were really attracted to the idea too of perhaps taking something that was a bookish typeface and adapting it for a fashion or editorial context as well. We thought it was a nice twist. And making it newsy and feel immediate. When a book typeface isn't what you, you don't naturally think of immediacy. Right. And so we wanted to see if we could bring that to it. And uh, so working through this idea, also a very small terminals, so it doesn't have those big, elegant ball terminals that you expect from a, a standard Dido in a fashion context. And uh, we were really excited about the squareness and angularity and, and organic quality of this sans serif. 
but um, I mean, looking at it here, it was maybe a bit too chaotic. And uh, imagining it in a display context, well, basically, they, they just didn't like it at all. Sorry. And you were right. <laughs> no, the hooks on the R were kind of problematic for me. I thought like the uh, the A's were just slightly too, I don't know, voluptuous. I don't know. Um, it just didn't feel quite, yeah, the direction that we wanted to go in. So we went back to the drawing board. Actually, yeah, I think we, we were looking too much at um, keeping it away from default. So doing everything we could to move it away from that in terms of mismatching the uh, angles of the terminals, adding details like that hook on the R. We were a bit hesitant going in because I think those references were like neo-grotesque and times. So how do you right. do something like new in your eyes? Yeah, how do you find something fresh in that well-trod territory? Yes. Particularly so with the neo-grotesque, Burton and I have both been there back to that well again and again over the last 10 years. Um, so finding finding a new trick. <laughs> so I, of course, the first thing we gravitate towards is the thing that's completely opposite from that, yeah. with the inconsistent terminals and everything. So it's a sans. <laughs> it could work, but it didn't work. So we went back. Um, I had remembered seeing this book by uh, Walter Keich, uh, Schriften Lettering Ecriture, from 1949. And uh, so this was not he was not a type designer. He was a teacher, and he did some sign painting and a lot of lettering. And um, you can see a lot of similarities between this and Univer. Uh, and this is from 1949. He was actually one of Adrian Frutiger's um, teachers. And Frutiger really internalized, I think, a lot of what he learned from Keich. And a lot of that comes through in his later work, particularly in Univer. And so Burton and I thought we might use this um, <clears throat> really as, as it was originally intended, not to digitize like an old typeface, but to use it like a lettering manual and just look at it and draw something that sort of followed what it was doing, but not an exact replica of it. And we ended up here, which had a bit more of that kind of default neo-grotesque feeling but was a bit too round and a bit too friendly. So Burton and I were really just passing the serif and the sands back and forth. And when one of us was working on one, the other of us was working on the other. Because they both weren't working at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so since neither of them were working, we thought, all right, let's get something right. And then we can use that as a basis to get the rest of it right. So this was a very different situation from Schneider where it was a very limited number of references and a very clear idea of what the typeface needed to do. This, it was a lot more, um, kind of a lot more ethereal, what we were trying to capture. And so there was a, a longer process of searching before we could get there. So I got as far with this sort of cake influenced sans serif as I could. And then I said, Burton, I'm out, I'm dropping this. I'll take the serif, and, and can you figure out something from here? Right. So I basically sort of looked at what Christian drew and looked at the Keich um, drawings, and I started trying to approach it from a different angle, um, bringing a little bit more rectangular forms back into the type, but keeping that higher contrast to keep it a little bit more elegant. Um, and I tried a couple versions of this, one where that felt pretty uniform, but a second version where the counters were a lot more square and the exterior count the interior counters were a lot more square and the exterior um, was a lot more round. We thought that sort of had an interesting tension. So we sort of were steadily progressing towards something that was a little bit more rectangular in its final or third iteration, a lot more square at least in its interior counters. Um, and at this point, the process became very impulsive. It was more based off of feeling and tone and atmosphere than um, any sort of references we were looking at at paper. Right. Like the feedback was very spontaneous and off the cuff. And I remember texting like Harry at one point, the latest version, and he just made a remark like, let's just push that squareness a little bit. And um, I sort of pushed it one more step. But I also changed that relationship, like what Pat, uh, Patrick was mentioning before. 
I made its silhouette square, but I made the interior counters round to give it that tension and to create some sort of, you know, twist in it. Um, I think the final thing that happened that seemed to click for us was we added a little bit more of a dramatic folio-esque swoop in that A-bowl yeah. to give it a little bit more crudeness. Um, and that is when it started to really like set for us, I think. And that tension between the interior forms, which really have a vertical bias to them, and the exterior forms, which have a horizontal bias to them, really had that feeling of immediacy and a certain kind of energy to them that was what this family turned out to need. And it looks really good, tightly spaced, as you can see, which I really like. And so the bolder it gets, the tighter it gets. Yeah. And uh, that, that difference in bias between the interior and exterior forms um, is more and more exaggerated the heavier it gets. So um, you still feel some of that kinetic quality in a block of text in this and the regular weight, but it's a, a big, bold headline where that really comes out. And the sheared um, overshoots, um, well, let's say the the top curve and the bottom curve of the O is sort of just sheared off. So that really allows for it to be tightly stacked, but because the counters are round, it doesn't feel too blocky or too rectangular. Because we were thinking again about this feeling of density mm -hmm. and how do you make a really dense headline? If you could stack it as tight as the uh, letter spacing is, you would have something that um, would lend itself to a very particular kind of, of graphic design. So now that we have the sands working, we could see really what was wrong with the serif. We had a newsy version, and we had a more old style version that was a bit quirkier, a bit more storybook, and they were, they were okay, but the more of it you saw the more the problems presented themselves. The, uh, the X height felt a bit big and, and a little too cartoony. There was something elegant about it, but something also that was too static. It just sat on the page. It didn't have enough tension in it. Even when it had these old style proportions, it was interesting, but it didn't feel immediate and it had no tension. So, we don't remember who made the suggestion. Patrick, I think it might have been you. Maybe, I don't remember. To angle the contrast. Yeah. Look at these. Or just to see, yeah. Look at these Times New Roman references again and angle the contrast and see what that does to it. And that seemed to help it feel a bit denser. And the other thing we started playing around with was the relationship between the contrast in a character like the O and the contrast in the serifs. So making the contrast lower and lower in the main strokes so that it didn't feel too fashion, it didn't feel too pretty, but playing it up in the serifs so there was some pretty element of this that when it became large didn't feel too chunky and inelegant. Angling the head serifs was another step that went really hand in hand with this angled contrast to make this feel kinetic and have that kind of tension that the sands now had thanks to its um, inner and exterior relationship. And sort of the final, um, one of the final detail changes that made a difference was um, relating fact a little bit more closely to Kippenberger in detail. Um, so as we're sort of looking at the Kippenberger A, we thought, well, what if we try that swooped bowl on uh, fact, just to relate the two a little bit more. And sort of, it's, it's kind of interesting when you're doing these detail changes, when you change one detail, other details start to fall into place. Um, actually, not only did that, that bowl change, but the terminal on the A also changed from um, what was previously very curled in, if you could go back. Oh, so you can go to this one, it shows it better. Oh, okay, uh, that was very curled in. Um, to something that was a little bit more floppy. And we found that with a curved bowl and a curled in terminal, it was just a little bit too formal and a little bit too, what's the word, decorative. Um, but sort of giving that 
terminal, the second terminal of that treatment, it made it a little bit more casual, which sort of counteracted that, that elegance of the swoopy bow and made that twist. The problem with this also was that it felt too referential. It felt like all the Times New Romans that have, have ever been done. And it felt too connected to a traditional news aesthetic. So giving it these uh, looser, um, kind of uncategorizable, floppy terminals on characters like A, C, and R was the final step that this seemed to need to take on a voice of its own. Made it more 70s, I guess, inadvertently, too. Yeah, which yeah. was a better match for Kippenberger. Right. And these two families are designed as a set with matching vertical proportions. And that carries through um, in all the weights and all the widths. The uh, condensed in both of these families ended up being used a lot more than we ever anticipated. And though the centers of the families really relate and can be used in similar ways, um, towards the fringes, they really wander off in their own particular individual directions. So this uh, poster width allows Kippenberger to be very loud and very dense. Where fact has this very lightweight that can be quiet and graceful in a way that Kippenberger can't. So we've got a, a fairly wide range of weights, also with a condensed. And two different kinds of contrast for the heaviest weight. Um, I think because um, the, the boldest, um, what is that, the display size, just didn't quite feel right at very large sizes for a couple of words at a time. So we wanted something that was a little more traditional in its contrast um, because the other traits, the ball terminals, the, the organic swoop on that A did enough to give this an individual personality that it could when it needed to be a slightly more traditional fashion typeface. And here's where you see the terminals getting very truncated, very tight to the main stem. It's like um, definitely a different feeling than before. Yeah. And we've already talked about um, how these weights relate together in Kippenberger. This, of course, has a condensed and goes all the way to this very, very compact poster that um, has to be really large to see the difference in, in uh, shape between the inner and outer forms, but um, definitely still has that inherent tension. We also had to do a, a range of alternates. Um, and a big part of this was because the families had, had taken such different forms um, in spite of their shared proportions, that they wanted the opportunity to turn some alternates on and make Kippenberger feel more like fact, or turn some alternates on and make fact feel more like Kippenberger with a simplified G and W and a different kind of R. The round versus square dots, the north-south. Oh, yeah. 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 And then to be able to um, have a completely separate set of alternates that aren't really native to either typeface so that they can be mixed together in a headline and sort of feel cohesive through their wrongness for both families at like once. A, yeah. The weird W. Yeah. And the slanted M. Yeah. And uh, for the first time, we had to do a text face to go with the display faces that we were creating. And um, it, it all came back to this idea of density. And uh, making sure it didn't look condensed. So this is uh, fact text. Comparing the same piece of text with imperial. Imperial, when you see it in isolation, feels very compact. But in a, a paragraph as short as this, we were able to save almost two full lines. Yeah. And so played out over the whole magazine, they got to cut fewer pictures because they could fit more text. And this is why Hanya approved the typeface. 
solely because she could fit more words on the page. So some examples of uh, the page of the cover layouts where the logo just moves all around the cover. It's never stationary. Yeah, and some more usage of um, Kippenberger and um, uh, fact here. There's uh, also this kind of contradiction now with um, uh, some handwriting that really kind of echoes some of the artist catalogs that we looked at. And, you know, that's Dan's writing because it's not really that nice, but it felt <laughs> perfect for what we wanted to, like the mood that it, that it evokes. Here's an example of a very, very tight uh, compressed page where there's literally four things, on, the four articles basically on the same, um, or fe mini features on the same page. Very dense. But there is still white space. Every once in a while we try to fight for our white space and we get it, but um, uh, here's an example. Of, we don't actually do this that often where we are, we've combined um, the Kippenberger, in fact, uh, so it might be something that we move to later, but um, I feel like this might be a good moment. More activations of uh, having the page be uncomfortably tight to certain uh, perimeters and um, looser in others. Yeah, and the, and the challenge really is to activate all the pages in ways that we hadn't explored before. This is a um, uh, feature on Judy Chicago. Um, page uh, that actually, I think Sean actually did this page when he was freelancing back at the magazine. This is um, just showing the different, um, uh, the way the type reflects sort of this idea of uh, move credits that are scrolling off the page. More activations. Yeah, bringing some of that handwriting back. And you can see here where the display, this is a very different feeling than we would have had with um, um, Schneider. It's, somehow it feels, yeah, there's a, I don't know if it's nostalgia, but there's something kind of, um, and it could be the images as well, but it definitely felt like a departure for T. Um, yeah, again, very twin inspired layout. Just a bold type across the bottom. And we're not afraid of making really small mini displays to let the page breathe. It's a very rare occur occurrence. Um, recent issue, our culture issue that focused on 36 months um, in the 80s, 1981 to 1983. It was a the cover Pantone was inspired by the ACT UP logo. This is a issue that we had been working on for a very long time and um, the actual inside of the magazine had, it was basically a redesign of the magazine that was just recently redesigned. It was like a completely its own kind of monster with this timeline that went across the bottom um, and a lot of incredible research, photo research from the, from the photo team at the magazine. Um, some more examples of really trying to take advantage of the page and the production techniques that we're, we're limited to. So this is like a four color black on top of a single color black, just so there's a slight idea of um, um, uh, foreground, background, where the place jumps out a little bit more. It's always fun to play with. Sometimes I, I hide little words inside display type and I always wonder if people can see it. And actually some people, some, if you hold a page at like, 45 degrees, you see a different opacity in the ink, and you can find messages. <laughs> From me to me, yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is a really fun issue to work on. And it's also, I mean, the, the digital life of, of the type is um, obviously super critical, so, uh, I mean, we didn't spend as much time hinting these faces as much, but I think you guys might have. No, but they, 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 we were lucky they happened to work. Yeah. 
it definitely gives us a little bit of a distinct uh, visual feel within templates. And I think it can be hard to have that particular sense of place um, of T within the New York Times website just because it is so templated. Yeah. And so the typefaces have to work even a bit harder than usual to provide that sense of place. Right. Some more display online. It was something like this. The, um, the text on the left, that's, you can't really do anything with the placement of that. That just is where it ends up in that right. kind of story. This is done by one of the members of Interactive Art Direction at the New York Times, Grant Gold, he'd made this illustration, moving illustration to accompany the, um, um, the, the, the issue, and it was really super impactful. And doing something a bit different yeah. um, for this special issue. Right. A lot of research, so every one of those highlighted um, phrases was a link to um, either uh, stories in the issue or research outside of the issue. It was really kind of a um, formidable task. So that brings us up to right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for, for listening to us. Thank you.